In April of 2016, Scott Cawthon revealed his next major FNAF project, Sister Location. People were very caught off guard by this announcement, since a new mainline game, at least right then, was not expected. Around this same time, FNAF World Update 2 came out, wherein we got our first look at one of Sister Location's main antagonists, Circus Baby. The desk man introduces her by saying that he has created her and that she is too powerful to stop. Then, she makes her appearance as a pair of glowing yellow eyes in the darkness and murders the desk man. Needless to say, the surprise guest got fans pretty excited to see more of this upcoming project. Not too soon after, the trailer for Sister Location was arbitrarily launched in typical Scott fashion. This trailer had the fans brewing with excitement. It brought so many never-before-seen things to the table. We got our first looks at Ballora and Betty Bap, two brand new characters, and an additional look at Circus Baby, who was seemingly set up as the main antagonist for this game. We also had a peek at the designs of the main four characters, each with faceplates that opened to reveal the animatronic endoskeleton. There were also fleeting looks at the new location that we'd be playing in, what seemed to be a below-ground bunker. Unlike the first three games, this did not look like a facility intended for public eyes. The retro-futuristic design of this new location was a surprising one, including the vehicle that we thought our characters were running through it, which is especially exciting because it implied that we could roam around at our own will, something which was really big glamoury for at the very start of the series. Needless to say, all this new content had the community bursting with the scene with excitement. The aesthetics of Sister Location were unlike anything seen before in the series, and I think the only game that rivals it in terms of the hype within the community in the months leading up to its release is Security Breach. And, in my opinion, Sister Location lived up to it. Sister Location is my favorite FNAF game. While it is certainly a jump from the first four entries in the series, the traditional FNAF structure being expelled, I think that's to its benefit and makes it a much better game. This game feels so much more structured and cohesive, not just going through the motions night by night with increasing difficulty, which is what ultimately part of what made FNAF 4 lose some of its charm for me. It feels like there's an actual story here. So let's go through night by night and start from the very beginning, the mini screen. This mini is probably my favorite in the series. I love how erratic it feels, with the text expanding and compacting rapidly, and how the animatronics switch in a disturbing, almost painful looking way. The harsh lighting is also very complimentary. It all creates a very intense and sinister atmosphere, that there's something very dark happening quite literally beneath the surface of this facility. Additionally, I think now is a good time to mention that this is the first FNAF game with an original soundtrack composed by Leon Riskin. While the themes are few and far between, the ones we do get are certified bangers. Gradual Liquidation is easily the best menu theme across the series to me. It's very reminiscent of Portal 2's music, which I of course love, and it's also perfect to get you hyped for the game. The themes prior to this have been ominous, but also pretty subtle, but this theme is much more intense and straightforward with its spookiness. The original soundtrack demonstrated that this is a new era of FNAF being ushered in, characterized by a much more over-the-top aesthetic and leaning more towards science fiction horror with the highly advanced technology scene henceforth. Also, I like that the little piano part at the end is brought back into order on the P30 simulator. Also, I didn't know where else to bring this up, but I like how every game from Sister Location onwards title has been a double entendre. Sister Location refers not only to the fact that this is a sister location of Freddy Fazbear's, but that this is also the sister's location. It's Circus Baby's Restaurant, who's possessed by Michael's sister, Elizabeth. Pizzeria Simulator is not only a pizza tycoon in gameplay, but it's also a literal simulation of a pizzeria designed to trap and free the remaining animatronics in game. Help one of your first to Fazbear Entertainment, not just wanting help testing their game, but the fact that the trap wants Vanessa's help to escape the game. It's clever and I like how it's been maintained across every game since. But, I digress. How about we get to talking about the, uh, the actual game. The first night of Sister Location is pretty uneventful. You descend into the facility, get shown the control shock mechanic, get a look at some of the characters before the night ends, and you leave. While this night isn't exactly anything to write home about upon initial play, given the context of the rest of the game having such a unique night-by-night -night structure, I think it's actually pretty clever. The game is deliberately set up to make it seem as though these mechanics are going to be incorporated regularly in the typical FNAF game style. You get a demonstration of climbing through vents and working the light and shock buttons. After all, this wouldn't be the first entry in the series with the first night of no threats. FNAF 3's Night 1 has no action and just gets you acquainted with your environment before Springtrap is introduced in Night 2 and the game really begins. So in Sister Location, you think this will be a similar situation. However, things take a very clear turn in a different direction when the power goes out in Night 2 and you have to break the assumed sequence. It's a clever way to go about expressing to the player that this game will not have the night-by-night -night structure we've become acquainted with. <laughs> And end night one. Between every night we get to watch the silly vampire sitcom, which at first glance is just a random inside joke or something that's shoehorned into the game for no discernible reason. However, it's actually there to build upon the motif that appears across Sister Location, which is that of family and relations. After all, Pizzeria Simulator is basically one big family reunion for the Aftons, and the second half of the first arc of FNAF focuses a lot more closely on the Afton family. 
The vampire sitcom is an analogy for Michael, William, and the mother. William clearly outcasts Michael, which is what led him to lash out and turn and take it out on his brother and take his frustrations too far. I mean, William sent Mike into a place he very well knew was a death trap to save his beloved daughter. He clearly doesn't care about the well-being of his son. Mike is also disconnected from his father in the sense that he uses presumably his mother's surname in FNAF 1. Despite the fact he's ostracized by William, though, he clearly bears a physical resemblance to him. He's confused for his father multiple times in the series, notably when he says the fun times. They thought I was you. This is reflected in the cartoon. A purple-clad vampire who works the night shift refuses to take ownership of his son, even though he resembles him very closely. While this extended metaphor is the most prominent example of the family motif, there's a lot more than that. Ballora and Baby are maternal characters with their miniature counterparts, Ennard asks if he wants to be with her again, the angsty teen voice alludes to the protagonist being the brother, Ennard is five characters merged into one entity, like a family unit, we hear Elizabeth's voice between knights, among others. This is one of the things that makes me love Sister Location. There's actually overarching symbols and motifs, things that make a good story. It feels like an actual structured story and not just an arbitrary series of events. I'll touch more upon this later. Anyway, on to Night 2. Night 2 opens with this. Welcome back for another night of intellectual stimulation, pivotal career choices, and self-reflection on past mistakes. Honestly, I think this game has a really good sense of humor, and it doesn't get enough credit for how funny it can be. Unfortunately, since most FNAF fans at the time of Sister Location's release were children, the thing that became the certified funny of Sister Location was Exotic Butters. It sucks because it's given the game a reputation of having profoundly unfunny lol random comedy, even though that's only really in the hand unit elevator gag. For the most part, I think the game is genuinely pretty funny, and I think a lot of credit to that goes to hand unit's voice actor, Andy Field. His delivery is just so straightforward and deadpan that it amplifies the funniness of all his alarming or questionable lines. Again, very reminiscent of Portal 2. This night is where things really begin to go awry. First of all, when you shock Ballora and Foxy, they don't reset, and the hand unit voice glitches out. Stranger yet, the shock button doesn't work in Baby's room, and then the power goes out. Here we meet Circus Baby for the first time. When we meet her, she's introduced as a helpful force to the player, showing them how to hide from the bitty babs, and then telling them the safe way to get through Ballora. I like how the main two narrators of the game, Hand Unit and Baby, are set up in such a way that you feel that neither of them are to be trusted. Hand Unit misleads you regarding how to get past Ballora, but then gives you the correct instructions to fix Freddy. Baby tells you how to get through Ballora and the Bitty Babs, but then she kidnaps you on night 4. You can't trust anyone down here. After facing off with the Bitty Babs, it's time to crawl through Ballora Gallery to go fix the power. After FNAF 4, I was kind of put off by audio cues as major mechanics in FNAF games, since in that game it was done in such an obnoxious way. But I think the couple times you do have to rely on audio in sister location, it's done pretty well. Ballora's music doesn't need to be turned up deafeningly loudly to hear it, and for it to effectively communicate when she's nearby. I also like how small this part makes you feel, with the door and Ballora herself being gargantuan. This subtle detail across the game of the visible area on the screen being shrunken is so effective at making the facility and characters feel massive. Speaking of massive, the part where Ballora twirls right in front of you is so splendidly disturbing. She's so big and she's right there, it makes you want to take your hands off the keyboard entirely and make no noise in case she could somehow hear you. Something else I really like about Sister Location is how you get to be up close and personal with the animatronics. Ballora, Funtime Foxy, and Freddy will get right up in your grill, and you get to be really hands-on with Circus Baby and Freddy when you do maintenance on them. While we're here, I want to mention that Ballora is the most underrated character in the series to me. She's so eerie in a way that no other character really manages to achieve for me. She's very elegant, but also has a distinctly inhuman quality about her, like her forced, upturned smile and closed eyes and unrealistic proportions. She also feels very expressive despite her single plastic expression. In the trailer and on the menu, her expression looks less like a smile and more so a grimace, almost pained. Her voice work is also lovely. She sounds graceful, but also somber and pensive. Honestly, I think she was robbed of a spot in Help Wanted by Funtime Foxy, because a VR stage with her would have been so incredibly creepy, especially if she was as huge as she was in Sister Location. Also, I didn't know where else to add this, but midway through Ballora Gallery, Handy Unit will very loudly tell you to hurry up, and it's never failed to startle me when doing this section. It seems you are taking a long time. Please proceed as quickly and as quietly as possible. It's really funny and clever, and there's a couple other unexpected jump scares I found pretty clever too later on. After making it past Ballora, it's time to restart the power of Funtime Freddy chasing you around the room. I like the little indication that he's your next challenge with the poster of him with the door that says get ready. This part is perhaps one of the most anxiety inducing experiences of my life. It's so intense and fast paced and you have so little time to get anything done. The moment you start to reload the power in an area, your danger meter shoots up and you have to go reset Freddy again. 
There's not a moment where you can't be on your feet, and it doesn't help that the lights are dim and flickery and a lot of the time Freddy will be obscured by shadows, and then when a spark of light brightens the room for a brief second you can see him looming over you. It's probably one of the most effectively anxiety inducing and suspenseful moments across the series for me, second only to the salvage minigames from Pizzeria Simulator. Also, I just wanted to shout out Kellen Goff's fantastic voice work for Funtime Freddy. He sounds so cartoonishly deranged and unhinged and insane, and he clearly had a lot of fun with the role, and I'm so glad he's continued to be recast as Freddy in pretty much every game since. And with that, Night 2 comes to an end. This night is probably the strongest in the game. We meet Baby, face off against three separate characters, and get what are in my opinion some of the most stressful and tense sequences across the entire series. It's a perfect microcosm of everything that makes Sister Location such a great game. Onward to Night 3. Night 3 gives us more of that great deadpan humor that we saw the night before. It became necessary for technicians to attempt to disconnect Funtime Freddy's power module. However, they were unsuccessful. Allowing them to try again would be an inefficient path forward, as we would need to allow six to eight weeks for recovery and physical therapy. Again, you hands off to any field for delivering this line since it's on the other side of Funtime Auditorium it makes all them to perform so the procedure I'm really glad Han Unit has assumed Let's the role of essentially the narrator first, of the franchise sure she's on her stage. Since their location because he's perfect for the role. Next, it's time to run through Funtime Auditorium so we can go do maintenance on Funtime Freddy. However, before this, you can also disregard Han Unit's instructions and go to Circus Gallery before Funtime Foxy. Here, you can listen to Baby's story where she recounts Elizabeth's death. I like how the spirit is implied to work alongside the Circus Baby AI here. Since the fun times are generally more advanced than the other animatronics we've seen so far in the series, it would make sense that they wouldn't become possessed as simply as the comparatively rudimentary classics. Elizabeth's spirit doesn't completely control Baby, I think she more so gave the AI sentience by whispering in her ear and supplanting her own schemes. This explains why Baby tells the story from the perspective of the animatronic and not Elizabeth, and why she says that she still hears her sometimes. I'll expand upon this more later. This also serves to make Baby a more sympathetic character, like she says on Night 5. Something bad always happens. She is more to sympathize with than just Dead Child, of which there are like 40 across the series already. Not only is she a dead child, but now she's forced to kill other kids in the same way she died. She's lonely and angry and sad, forced to be a murder machine and bound to the thing that was supposedly designed with her specifically in mind. Why did that happen? I'll discuss Baby as a character more later. Anyway, let's progress with the main story. While I find Funtime Auditorium generally weaker than Ballora Gallery, it still has some cool things to note. Like I mentioned before, I like how close Foxy can get to you, and I like how spastic and twitchy his movements are. The flash beacon mechanic is also a good idea. You can flash the light into a light up the room for a second, and you can get a general idea of where he is, but only vaguely before he vanishes into the darkness again. It's especially disturbing when you flash the light and he's inches away from you. I don't find it quite as effective as Ballora dancing right past you, but it's definitely still creepy and cool. Now it's time to fix Funtime Freddy. You start by opening his face plates by pressing a series of small, hard to see buttons on his face, and when you do it successfully, this happens. Good job. This is one of the best jump scares in a FNAF game to me. It catches you especially off guard because you're leaning in and squinting at the screen trying to find this tiny button, and the best part is it's not even a game over, it's just there to troll you, and Scott's also making fun of himself in a way. Very clever and very startling. This maintenance minigame has a lot of potential, and I'm glad that we got our levels in a similar vein to it in Help Wanted and Security Breach. And I'm also glad we didn't get this annoying Bonnie part 2 in them, because there's little to no direction with this minigame, and I'm still not entirely clear on what the intended strategy was here. That aside, an overall pretty good minigame and a solid night. I think the way by which Night 4 starts is kind of stupid, and the gameplay for the night is definitely way too difficult. However, it does give me the opportunity to highlight something else that makes Sister Location so good to me. In this game, the main antagonist is an actual character and not just a boogeyman. I really like the way Baby is written and the way the AI is implied to work alongside Elizabeth's spirit. While their plan was seemingly coming along pretty well, Baby ended up putting the whole thing in jeopardy by kidnapping Michael on this night, and it's likely because Elizabeth began to recognize him as William, and being an angry and spiteful dead child, she wanted to get petty revenge even if she was sabotaging her own plan. This would also explain why the scooper makes her so angry. Elizabeth is the one primarily controlling Baby's consciousness, and since she's been scooped before, it probably brings up bad memories for her. The scooper line also serves to prove my point before about how Elizabeth influences Baby's consciousness. This line... I wonder, though... If you were a freshly opened pint of ice cream, how you would feel about something with that name? Thankfully, I don't think a freshly opened pint of ice cream feels anything at all. It's a metaphor for how Elizabeth affected the baby AI. 
At first, Baby didn't feel anything about the scooper, but when Elizabeth's spirit began supplanting her own thoughts into the AI, she began to feel the pain and realize the injustice of it. Shout out to FNAF DYFR on Reddit for pointing this out. Also, the reincorporation of the ice cream motif is nice. Not only is this concept a lot more creative than just dead child stuffed in suit, they fully haunt the suit, like in the first four games, Baby's also a much more interesting character for it. Baby's not just some spooky monster, she's an actual character with things like motives, character traits, and a more interesting backstory than just dead child. She's an actually compelling character, and is actually kind of sympathetic in her goals. She's angry and spiteful towards her father, who, based on how he treats her in the novels, rarely ever gave her the time of day, and rightfully resents him for it. She's what, 10 years old at most? Of course she goes about vengeance in a petty way, she's not even a teenager and her father's a murderer. Anyway, the night itself. Like I said, the gameplay is frustratingly difficult and obnoxious. However, the animations of the Minirinus climbing into and up the sides of the suit are so superbly disturbing. These guys are little rodents and are creepy as hell, and it's really sad they've only appeared in a FNAF game on a really frustrating night. Since you'll be dying quite a bit on this night, though, you'll probably encounter the one death minigame in Sister Location here. Minigames have been a staple of FNAF since the second game. Since there's only so much lore you can express via the repetitive gameplay of the first four games, Scott had to come up with a more creative way to show lore bits. I think that in FNAF 2 this was done pretty well. The arcade game style fit the kids' pizza tainment restaurant vibe perfectly, and I really like how low res he made it look with the dark lines covering the screen. They're vague enough to have a creepy vibe, but also not too unclear to be unable to express what it's trying to say. However, I think that FNAF 3 and 4 didn't achieve this as effectively. FNAF 3's minigames are just weird, and it's unclear what they're supposed to represent, if anything at all. Meanwhile, FNAF 4's minigames have the opposite problem, they're just too straightforward. The addition of actual dialogue from people gets rid of any creepiness they might have had, and is kind of indicative of the fact that Scott was running out of ways to create a coherent timeline. So in Sister Location, Scott dialed it all the way back to just one minigame, and I think that was a wise choice. This minigame is really strong, and generally more complex than the previous ones. First of all, there's an actual strategy to this one you can figure out to find the minigame's secret, not just arbitrary walls you can face through like in FNAF 3, and not just wandering around until it ends like FNAF 4. Also, you can piece the pattern together not only from Baby's story in Night 3, but also just through trial and error and your own smarts. Secondly, this minigame just has a very nice design. Baby's design here is very cute, and the soundtrack for this minigame is also very nice. It's just generally more appealing to play than something like FNAF 3 secret minigames. However, things get a whole lot less cute if you feed every child and manage to get the ice cream. The way the soundtrack changes is really cool and suddenly damages the cheerful atmosphere of the minigame and makes something feel immensely wrong. It reminds me of the Snow Grave version of the city theme in Deltarune Chapter 2, how it's the same melody but there's subtle changes in it that makes something feel wrong. I like the grainy static that backs the slower version too. It's a subtle detail but makes it feel all the more ominous. And once you return to the start with the ice cream, forth comes Elizabeth Afton, and before she can do anything, Baby snatches her up. It's a really good scare that catches you off guard and is really alarming. After you get the ice cream, you know something bad is gonna happen and you're dreading what'll come. When Elizabeth appears on screen, you can pretty quickly realize the fate that's about to befall her. The buildup of tension as the timer ticks away and the music slows down makes the trek back to the start so immensely eerie and wrong feeling. I also like the little detail that Baby has blue eyes in the minigame, and in the main game her eyes are green. Only after capturing the green-eyed Elizabeth. While this just seems like a design oversight at first, it's actually a pretty critical detail, which is something I really appreciate about not just the steel location, but FNAF as a whole. Pretty much every detail has some kind of bearing on the plot, there's barely anything that's just there for the sake of being there. So with the minigame done, night 4 is over. Now on to night the 5th, the final night of Sister Location. By the way, not counting Custom Night, which isn't canon, Sister Location is the only FNAF game that actually has only 5 canon nights. After descending the elevator and entering the control module, you're greeted with this site. Great. Now let's check on Funtime Foxy. This is a very startling thing to see, especially in a FNAF game, and for Hanyu to just ignore it like everything is fine makes it all the more disturbing. Now it's time to go back through Funtime Auditorium to go repair Baby. While there aren't any threats going through this time, I think that actually serves to benefit the atmosphere. It feels climactic and suspenseful, like something terrible is soon to happen, a greater threat than anything you've faced until now. Showing up in parts and service, we meet an out-of-commission baby with her eyes hollowed out. Little do we know, though, that she's actually already merged with Ennard and is speaking behind her old body. She then asks us to help her stop killing children against her will. While what she says here is manipulative and said with the intent of trying to lure us into the scooping room, she's also not wrong. Baby is a pitiful character. She's tormented with the consciousness of a human, but unable to actually have much control. She's in a constant state of paralysis, aware of her actions, but unable to do anything to stop them. After sending Baby's body off to the scooping room, you can actually see Ennard in the darkness behind the conveyor belt. I like the weird, eerie tentacle ambiance that it makes, it really creates an unsettling feeling, like the threat we're about to face is alien and much worse than the other challenges thus far. Finally, it's time to crawl back through Funtime Auditorium to get to the scooping room. I actually do have a bit of a gripe with this part, and it's just the lack of direction here. It took me so long to realize that you were supposed to use the A and D keys, and not only that, but you were supposed to combine them with the W key. Like Stephanie said on GT Live, if the game just flashed up WASD at the start, I would have known to use it at this point. 
At every other point in the game thus far, there was a prompt for the controls that needed to be used for that section, so to just assume players will know to use A and D here was not the most intuitive design choice on Scott's part. Anyway, that nitpick out of the way, at long last we've reached the finale of Sister Location. Here we see Baby's plan finally come to fruition. I love how the reveal slowly unravels and everything begins to come together as you realize what's about to happen. First you see the scattered remains of the animatronics along the floor, and then Baby refers to herself in the third person. And it emerges from behind the wall and tells you that but if we looked like you, then we could hide. If we looked like you, then we would have somewhere to go. You quickly realize what's about to happen, but before you can react, the siren goes off, and you're stricken to the abdomen by the scooper. Then we see Michael's reflection in the mirror open its eyes to reveal the violet eyes of Ballora, bringing sister location to an end. But is that really the end? Well, yes it is, it's the true ending. But while I think this is a quality conclusion on its own, there's another ending you can find that's even more climactic. If you ignore Baby's instructions in Funtime Auditorium and obtain a keycard from completing the minigame, you can find the true final challenge of Sister Location, the private room. This is one of, if not my favorite, stage across the FNAF series. I love the whole atmosphere of it. It's one of the only levels in a FNAF game that truly feels like a final boss battle, achieving that feel of climactic is much better than the final showdown of Security Breach. So let's go through and discuss what makes this finale so great. To begin with, Ennard's design is just really cool. I remember being kind of disappointed when I initially saw Ennard's in-game design because I wanted it to be like a cable tentacle monster, but thinking about it now, the design we got is definitely a lot cooler and less cheesy than the wire squid. First of all, this thing looks a lot more intimidating than what that would probably look like. It actually has mass, and you probably couldn't just chop off its limbs by slamming the door on it. Second of all, I really like how Ennard resembles a skeleton, but also has muscle mass, or the robot equivalent. It gives the effect of looking like a decaying corpse, muscles and skin loosely hanging off the bones, which besides just being a spooky design choice, is also clever considering what later becomes of Ennard. Sister Location stays winning with the best designs across the series. Second of all, I love how the story unfolds as the night continues. When you first begin the challenge, you hear the voice of Baby guilt tripping you and asking you why you didn't trust her. As the night progresses though, her lines change from less of a regretful tone to more of a pleading one. Eventually, she drops the facade of pitifulness and sadness and just straight up asks you to let them inside, pointing out that if they fail, they won't be able to try again. 4am, though, is when Ennard's aggressiveness really ramps up. At this point, in a last ditch effort to get you to surrender, Ennard starts talking to you in Elizabeth's voice, begging to be let in. Along with this, Ennard also becomes much more hostile and its attack patterns become a lot more aggressive. The window of time you have between Ennard arriving at the door and your time to close it drastically shrinks. You can feel the desperation of the animatronics in the gameplay as they panic to get into your room because, like Baby said, if they fail now they won't be able to try again. This is their final attempt. They're pulling out every strategy available, trying anything and everything to get to you. The gameplay for this night is also just so good. It feels like a much more refined version of FNAF 1's gameplay. First of all, the cameras are a lot more functionally important at this stage and are a lot more necessary to use. Going along with this, I also really like how conservative the game forces you to be with your power usage. Even in an ideal run, you're going to cut it very close with the battery. The use of auditory cues in this night is also a lot better than FNAF 4's. They're subtle, but they're definitely audible and clear. I think it also serves to make your situation a lot more intense and ominous. Since you have to use the cameras very sparingly, you need to rely on audio a lot more, which is a lot less reliable than a very clear camera feed. You kinda have to just hope that your assessment based on the noises under makes it correct, lest you waste any unnecessary power, because one second on the cameras too long might just spell out death for you. What really ties this level together, though, is the theme, Watcher 6. Watcher 6 is a certified banger, and probably the best track across the entire series, the only one coming remotely close to it being Peter E. Simulator's Nowhere to Run. This theme feels so sinister, like we really have stumbled upon something not intended for our eyes. It really just makes the whole night pop. The one thing I'm not too fond of in this stage is how a power outage results in an instant death. Part of the fun of the original FNAF was the power running out at the tail end of the night, and the suspense of praying that the clock would hit 6 before Freddy got to you. When you suffer a power outage, you immediately know it's coming and it loses that suspense. But that small thing is just a little blemish on an otherwise sublime final night. Shedding your former facade entirely, when you reach 6am, Baby sends you off hissing. And with that, we have 100% in Sister Location, so let's talk now about what all in all makes Sister Location my favorite game. Ultimately, I think the thing that makes Sister Location so good to me is that it actually has a plot. Rather than just being seemingly random events strung together, the game feels like an actual story that follows the three-act structure. You have your exposition, rising action, climax, falling action, and resolution. A story of events, conflict, and resolution. This feels like a cohesive narrative that we're actually engaging with, not just passively watching unfold. There's things like symbolism and motifs and metaphors, elements that make a good story. An engaging narrative with symbolic elements that keep you wondering what they mean and eager to see where the story goes next. Sister Location is truly a uniquely compelling FNAF game, and I really want to get more story-driven FNAF titles like it. 
Sorry, security breach. <laughs> 